Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Alberto Rossi, Associate Director for the Center of Financial Markets and Policy at Georgetown. Welcome back to our seminar series on FinTech. Uh, today is a trading apps day. Uh, we have three great papers focusing on how individual investors trade and think. So the first paper is going to analyze how investors change their trading behavior when they move from trading on their computer to trading on their phones, on their mobile apps. Uh, the second paper instead is going to study how individual investors change their market outlook and how their thinking evolved during the COVID crisis. And finally, the third paper instead is going to focus on how individual investors trade on news. And um, so I think we're going to have a phenomenal kind of uh, lineup of paper. I'm super excited. So let's, uh, without further ado, let's move to the first presentation, who is going to be uh, Alessandro Previsquero, is going to present the paper, Smartphone Investing. Uh, within investor uh, time analysis of new technologies and trading behavior. As a reminder, uh, Alessandro will talk uninterrupted for 20 to 25 minutes. We will then have uh, five to 10 minutes uh, for questions. You can raise your hand uh, to ask a question. You can ask uh, your question in the chat. Uh, two things before we get started. First of all, if you can turn on your camera, that would be awesome. It would make a much better kind of event uh, for everyone. And then second, um, I would like to thank um, Anna Cormis for helping tremendously with uh, setting up the event and with the organization. So, Alessandro, you may take it away. Uh, thanks, Alberto, for inviting me to present this paper. Let me just uh, share the screen. You should be able to see it right now. So this is joint work with my colleague Ankit Kalda at Indiana University, uh, Benny Luz from Technical University of Munich, who is here in the audience, and Andreas Aketal from Gates University. Um, what we are after here is we really want to try to understand better the effect of new technology on investor behavior. And this is not a new question that we're trying to answer in finance, because uh, uh, there is the consensus that once we introduce new technologies, uh, then uh, those new technology might be detrimental to portfolio, investor portfolio efficiency. Classical example being when we move uh, the, the introduction of internet and online trading. Um, a key thing that we want to point out is that the, the, the identification, the empirical setup here in, in all this study basically relies on comparing uh, an investor uh, before and after she joins the new technology. Uh, there could be a control group and there could be some randomization that is introduced by, for example, marketing campaign or phone calls to uh, push the adoption of new technology. But what I want to be clear on is uh, the idea that new technology change investor behavior uh, relies on two assumptions. The first one is that uh, absent the new technology, investor would have continued to behave the same way. In other words, uh, the, the key assumption here is that uh, investor pre-technology adoption is a good counterfactual for investor after uh, the, 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 the adoption of technology. The second as important assumption here is that investors do not substitute across technology and platforms. And so uh, that's one story that could lead us to believe that technology change behavior, but there could be another story. The first one is, there could be other alternative stories. The first one is that investors adapt the technology exactly because they want to change their behavior. And in this case, then myself before the adoption of the technology is not a good counterfactual for my behavior after I started using a smartphone. Uh, the second uh, potential ex um, story is that um, investors use the technology just to execute a specific subset of the overall trading. And so uh, the, the issue here is not a minor issue because we can largely overestimate the effect of technology on investor behavior uh, if uh, the, the technology are fulfilling some untapped demand. So I want to trade more. I would trade more anyway. Now I just happen to be trading more uh, using the smartphone. So the smartphone might facilitate this untapped demand or the new technology is just fulfilling substitute demand. I just concentrate all my derivative trading on the smartphone and but then in my overall portfolio, nothing changes. And the policy implications are actually starkly different uh, because uh, under the scenario that there is an untapped demand uh, or substitution, uh, the new technology might actually be helping investor 
But if the new technology is actually causing some dramatic change in investor behavior, then the new technology might be harming investor. And these are just two articles that, you know, uh, spaced space apart uh, uh, six months. Last summer, uh, there was a college student that committed suicide uh, and he ended up being $70,000 in debt, trading in Robinhood using options. And we all know the recent GameStop saga where kind of Robin Hood was cast a bit as a villain. So uh, now let me tell you, we use smartphone to study the effect of technology more broadly, but smartphone, the user smartphone is interested to study in itself. Uh, there are over 250 million smartphones in the US. Uh, the number of minutes spent on smartphone is uh, roughly speaking nowadays four hours, 240 minutes per day. Uh, if we look at the breakdown of uh, internet presence using either smartphone versus desktop, uh, we are we spend five times um, more minutes using uh, smartphone than desktop, and this is kind of a worldwide trend. Also, in trading, the, what we are studying here, uh, it is uh, um, the stats that's floating around is that twenty percent of retail trades in online brokers seems to be happening via mobile device. And this percentage is, is bound to double in the next few years. So what do we study? What are our hypotheses? In the paper, we have a, 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 a section on hypothesis development here. I'm just going to touch briefly. First of all, we're going to study the effect on smartphone trades on risk taking. On the one hand, uh, smartphone might reduce searching cost, monitoring cost, and hence facilitating more stock market participation and risk taking. On the other end, there is a bit of a behavioral story associated with the idea that if we have constant feedback on our trades, we might suffer myopic loss aversion and we might be less likely to take risk. There is also a link between uh, smartphone trading and preference for skewness or gambling. We know that smartphone seems to foster more intuitive system one thinking, what Ben Kahneman would call fast thinking. And fast thinking is associated with prospect theory and prospect theory preferences for lotteries. And so smartphone might foster this uh, preference for lottery type stocks. Also, technology could increase or decrease investment biases. We have example that, that a robot advisor might actually be good for investor increasing portfolio efficiency. But there is evidence uh, that comes from other disciplines that when we do purchases using smartphone, we tend to be overly emotional by unnecessary stuff. And there is evidence that comes from peer-to-peer -peer lending, but it's shown that uh, using smartphone, we tend to make worse investment decisions. And so I think it's like, a, it's good to study this empirically because you can see that uh, it's not obvious which direction smartphone might drive investor. What do we do in this paper? We have data transaction level data from two large German retail banks. They have both introduced trading apps. The key feature here is that we are gonna be able to compare the same investor within the same month trading across platforms. And so what do we find is that when you trade using smartphone, you buy riskier assets. You are more likely to purchase investment with more positive skewness, lottery type investment. And you are also more likely to buy past winners and past losers. Um, we rule out the fact that there are substitution effects because what we find is that after you, you start using smartphone, we find similar behavior also on other platforms. So this is, would suggest somehow uh, spillover effects. We also investigate the mechanism of play and in the interest of time, I'm just gonna mention a couple of things. We find evidence that uh, the effect of smartphones are uh, stronger in the after hours trading, which kind of suggests this idea the system one intuitive thinking might be important here. We don't find evidence that digital nudges, the screen size or just initial enthusiasm drive our results. I'm gonna be more clear what I mean by digital nudges later on. So the data comes from two large German retail banks. A key feature is that we know for at least one bank exactly whether this is your primary account. Um, and we have data on over two, 22 million transactions from 180,000 customers. And in, in, between 2010 and 2017, 80,000 of these customers trade using smartphone at least once. 
Um, so that's kind of the distribution of uh, smartphone trades, number of smartphone trades, conditional on having trade at least once on smartphones. And what you see here is in our sample, there is a, an uptake in trades done using smartphone. And by the end of the sample, uh, people that use smartphone at least once, they do 20% of their trade using smartphone, which is kind of uh, similar to the data we have seen for the same time period in the US. Uh, how do phone users compare to non-phone users? First of all, phone users trade more often, 10 versus five trade per month. Uh, the average value of trade seems higher, 4,500 euros versus 3,800. They are more likely to buy risky assets, more volatile assets, more likely to buy lottery type assets or top performers, past winners. They are also more likely to buy warrants and, and certificates. When we get to demographics information, there is no um, you know, substantial difference in income. There is difference in wealth. Phone users uh, tend to be wealthier, more likely to be in the highest wealth being having uh, reported wealth of uh, in excess of 100,000 uh, euros. Uh, they have shorter tenure with the bank. They are younger, eight years younger on average, less likely to be female. So let me get to the key here. The key here is that, you know, if you just try to compare smartphone trades to non-smartphone trades, we are gonna end up in this huge selection problem. And even if we were to control for investor fixed effect, they might not cut it, because again, investors might change over time, they might become more financially sophisticated, and they, this change or a change in attitude might be uh, driving uh, the adoption of smartphone in the first place. Uh, a key contribution here is that we can run all our analysis using investor buy time fixed effect. And when you do that, you will be comparing the same investor within the same time, within the same month across technologies. Now, uh, to estimate our spillover effects or substitution effect, we will be using a, a slightly different design that relies on diff in diff. I will be discussing that later on. So let me go straight into the results then. Um, we will be, I will be presenting results using four different specifications for most of the main results. Uh, so column one, we don't have any fixed effect. Column two, we adjust for individual fixed effect and year fixed effect. So this would take care of, for example, non-observable, but they are, that are non-time varying. Uh, but then to account for unobservable that are time varying, we can have individual by year fixed effect, that's the estimate in column three, or individual by month fixed effect. That's kind of the most stringent, uh, if you wish, um, um, estimation we can do, uh, specification we can do. What do we find? Uh, the probability of buying risky assets increase when you trade using smartphone. Um, everything is um, highly statistically significant from an economic uh, standpoint. Uh, the probability increase, uh, for example, in column four by 3% of the unconditional mean. Now, this is a small effect, but bear in mind that the unconditional mean here of buying risky assets is already 95%. So I think it's more informative to buy what type of risk, to look at what type of risky assets investors buy and we're gonna look at the volatility and the skewness of these of this, of this assets that, that are purchased. What you find here is, I'm gonna focus from now on mostly on column four, but the pattern are always the same. As we move from column one to column four, the estimates kind of become slightly lower, but they, are, they, ha they have the same sign and, and similar magnitude. Uh, so when we compare the same investor within the same month, uh, we find that when he purchased, she purchased stocks using, she purchased assets using smartphone, then uh, she's more likely to buy higher volatility stocks, uh, seven, percent, seven percentage points higher volatility stocks with an unconditional mean of 22%. Similar results for skewness, um, and the results now is 18% of the standard deviation of skewness. Again, highly economically significant. The best way I want you to think about these results of volatility and skewness I think is, uh, we can sum this up looking at the probability of buying lottery stocks. And lottery type assets here, I should say assets, um, here follow the definition of Kumar in his JF paper. They are assets that have above median uh, volatility, above median skewness, below median price. And uh, in our sample, smartphone adopters 
uh, have a 12% likelihood of buying lottery stocks. And this likelihood increased by 5.6 percentage points when they trade using smartphones. So increased by 37%, uh, substantial increase. So after we look at volatility skewness lottery type, we look at past winners and past losers as a kind of a, the train chasing on the contrarian behavior they've been shown in retail investor. And we do find dramatically, a dramatic uh, effect there too. The probability of buying uh, in the top 10% of the past year return performance go up by 8.7 percentage points or 51% of the unconditional mean when we think when we look at past winners. Similar results when we look at the bottom 10% of the past year performance. So we can call this the past losers. When you trade using smartphone, uh, the probability go up by 69% uh, of the unconditional mean. So very strong, economically strong and statistically strong results. When you trade using smartphone, again, this, these are the same investor within the same month. Uh, they are gonna be more likely to buy lottery type stock, past winners, past losers. Uh, a key thing though that we wanna rule out here is that investors are simply substituting across platform. And for doing that, we change our empirical specification. And basically what we do is we run a diff in diff um, everybody in the sample eventually end up joining, uh, adopting the smartphone technology. So the identification comes here for, from comparing uh, early adopters to late adopters. What we find here, uh, if you, under the null of substitution effect, you would expect here negative estimates in all the coefficients. So whatever we have seen in increasing the likelihood of buying winners using smartphone, uh, if there are full substitution effects should be offset uh, with a, a negative coefficient if we look at non-smartphone trades. But what we have here is, again, the, I repeat this, we are looking at all the trades that happen in not using smartphone, and we are comparing before and after you join, uh, you start adopting smartphone. What do we find is that all the coefficients we estimate are positive, four out of five are statistically significant. And this is pointing out towards the evidence that, if anything, we seem to have a small positive spillover effects, not negative substitution effect. Now, you might be worried that, uh, you know, early versus late joiners, uh, early joiners might not be uh, the, the, the right counterfactual for late joiners and vice versa. And, and so what we do is we do another diff in diff uh, where we basically compare the staggered introduction of different apps. So the iOS app was introduced months before the Android apps. And so what we do now, we repeat the diff in diff, but we use the smartphone launch as a date. Uh, and this is less likely to be endogenous because it's, it basically depends only on the type of device you have, uh, not uh, when you decide to join. What we find again here in this diff in diff is uh, all the point estimates are positive, three out of five are statistically significant. So when you look at these all together, we, we feel that we can rule out substitution effect. We don't find that you start buying less lottery type, less winner, less loser in your non-smartphone trading after you start using the smartphone. We do some graphical analysis of, of pre-trends here being these diff and diff. This is the last case, the staggered adoption of, of uh, the staggered launch of, of different apps. And again, you see here, no pre-trend before, after you see that eventually the, the effects become positive, uh, the timing is such that you find a delayed response because here we are basically uh, assuming that everybody joins at the time that the app is launched, but that's not what happens in practice because people don't join at the time that the app is launched. They join on their own time. So uh, after we kind of establish these main results and then we establish that there are no uh, strong uh, substitution effects, we can rule out substitution effect. Then we start investigating the mechanism. And in the interest of time, I will be showing you one piece of evidence that seems to be explaining what's might be happening and ruling out another piece of evidence. So first we look at the time of trading. Uh, and so what we do as a first step is we include in our individual by month fixed effect specification, the column four I show you so far, we include a trade hour by year fixed effect. So then we get to compare trades that happen during the same year at the same trading hour. So 9 to 10 a.m. We do one hour intervals. 
And what you find here is that although the coefficients uh, of smartphone effects stay uh, strongly economically and, uh, and statistically significant, these effects uh, become, uh, these estimates are mitigated, are attenuated compared to our baseline, pointing to the notion that the timing of trading must, must driving some of the, our results. So we dig deeper and we split our sample between trading during market hour, which is 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. versus trading after hour, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. And what you find is that when we look at trading after hours, the effect of smartphones for all the outcome variable tend to be two, three times as large as the effect of trading during market hours. We interpret these as uh, evidence uh, consistent with the idea that a smartphone might be fostering or facilitating more system one intuitive thinking. Because at the end of the day, you're gonna be, uh, there is gonna be a, um, decision fatigue kicking in. People are more likely to rely on system one when they make decision, and you're more likely to do so, for example, if you are in your own home instead of being at work. Now, we run also falsification tests showing that this has nothing to do with the fact that markets are open or closed. When we look at the morning hour between 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., markets are still closed, but you know, decision fatigue is not there. Uh, you are less likely to be using system one, the intuitive system. There, we do find effects similar to the one we find during market hours, weaker than what we find during after hours. So the system one intuitive thinking seems to explain what might be happening here. Something that does not explain our results are what we call digital nudges. There is the idea that this smartphone app prominently might feature, for example, past winners, past losers, daily winners, daily losers. And if that's the case, then these digital nudges are driving investor behavior. There is nothing in terms of how investors operate. It's all almost mechanically driven by the app. If the app were to eliminate the first screen with the daily winners, daily losers, then this effect might disappear. And so what do we do here? We split our sample and we look at trades that happen in individual stocks versus mutual funds. And the key notion here is that the app is gonna feature past winners and losers among individual stocks, but it doesn't feature past winners and losers among mutual funds. So if our results were to be driven by digital nudges, we would expect to be, them to be concentrated in individual stocks and to almost not be there for mutual funds. Uh, instead, we do find that the effects are strong on both sides. If anything, they appear to be stronger for mutual funds. Now, we also run this analysis separately for certificate, option, and warrants, and we do find the results there. And again, there is nowhere on this app where certificates, option, and warrants are winners or losers are prominently featured. Uh, we also look whether or not the initial enthusiasm might be driving the effect. People might get excited, trade for a few quarters, and then go back to their normal behavior. What do we find here with the caveat that we can only observe behavior for up to 10 quarters? We do find that this effect seems to be uh, pretty robust over time. They are not short-lived. They are positive and they're pretty much very similar over quarters. So um, to conclude, uh, we have a specific setting that allow us to compare trades of the same investor within the same month across platform. What do we find? Trading using smartphone uh, uh, gets you to buy riskier assets, high skewness, more lottery type assets, more past winner, more past losers. Uh, we can rule out substitution effect. If anything, there is, seems to be a bit of learning and spillover. You tend to do more of this behavior also when you don't trade using smartphones. Uh, in terms of the mechanism, our effect seems to be uh, partially explained by the time of the, of the day at which we trade. And we believe this is supporting the notion that investor uh, smartphone facilitate or foster more intuitive thinking. Uh, we don't find evidence that our effects are explained by digital nudges, uh, mechanically uh, ranks of past winners or loser, or I haven't had time to discuss this, we don't find the screen size dri that drives our effect because uh, iPad and iPhone have the same effect on trading. Um, if you want to think about this, uh, you know, in a world where more and more investors are going to be start trading using smartphone and, and those investors are going to be more likely to push up the price of uh, lottery type stocks or past winner or past loser, 
there might be implication for the aggregate markets and valuation of these different stocks in aggregate markets. Um, thanks. Thank you so much, Alessandro, for the great presentation. Uh, yeah, we have already a couple of uh, questions in the chat. If uh, anybody wants to ask their question live, feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you. But let me just start with uh, a couple of the questions that were in the chat. So number one, I start from the bottom and I had exactly the same um, kind of um, idea. So Antonio Gargano is asking this question and uh, you know we think alike <laughs> given that we, we've been working together for so long. But the question is, do you have any results on the future performance of the trades made on smartphones versus trades on the, using the desktop? So yeah. are these people getting themselves into the hole or are they actually are they making better investment decisions? Uh, so the, the, I think it's the, uh, that's, uh, the performance is on our kind of first on our to-do list. We kind of collect the data also on performance and fees. Uh, so, so far I cannot discuss that uh, to the extent that we know that buying lottery type stocks and buying and doing trend chasing seems to be uh, shown to be kind of a detrimental to your portfolio performance. My prior would be that we're gonna find lower returns, but uh, that's, that's up to, to be seen. Okay, so second question. This is uh, I was one thing that you guys showed that you focus a lot on the uh, the lottery type uh, of uh, stocks. So, but do you actually have any results regarding the substitution between individual stock trading and mutual fund trading? So, are these people leaving their mutual fund holdings and starting trading individual stocks the moment they get into this kind of slot machine of uh, the trading app, or instead they keep on buying their um, their in their mutual funds? Um, it's a good question. I, I, I think it's something we can definitely test. Uh, the reason why, let me just elaborate a bit. The reason why, because I kind of glanced over this, the reason why we had a strong prior about lottery type of stocks, it comes from this notion that, you know, the system one, system two thinking. When you think fast, you're going to be more likely to use prospect theory type of thinking. And there is a clear prediction there that you would prefer lottery type stocks. There is also a recent paper that say that preference for lottery type stocks goes up when there is social interaction and it's Bali et al paper. And we think that, you know, smartphone is going to foster social interaction and this type of demand for lottery type stocks. Um, actually, I should say lottery type assets because we find this also in, you know, lottery type mutual funds and other asset classes, not just individual stocks. Yeah, so as I, this is actually a question that was uh, kind of links nicely to Neil Stockton was asking, what is a lottery type asset if it is a passive mutual fund? Or maybe you're talking about active mutual funds. So we have the universe of mutual funds. So we, we separate our investment into individual stocks, mutual funds, and then other alternatives, which are certificates, warrants. And so what you do is basically you look at the universe of mutual funds and then you rank them based on uh, skewness, volatility, and price. And so uh, my prediction is that if you look at these uh, lottery type mutual funds, this is going to be the actively managed ones. I see, see, perfect. And then I think we have uh, time for one more question. This comes from Rory Hatfield, and I think it's actually more of a suggestion, and I think is uh, very well taken. Is a uh, is a uh, comment is saying, well, maybe what you should do is also try to consider the interaction between uh, smartphone using and uh, how much uh, trading commissions have gone down. So you may find a much harder or much stronger kind of effect the moment that you have people trading with their app and you remove all the frictions that uh, these uh, commissions uh, could have been. And I know that there have been, there have been work that have tried to analyze how this uh, changes in um, trading commissions affect individual trading, but not in the context of the trading app. So to, to the best of our knowledge, like we, for the two banks, there were still trading commission in the time when we analyzed that. Recently, one of the two banks has promoted a zero fee commissions. Uh, so we are kind of trying to get the data to, about that. But the sample period we have so far, uh, those were investor paying trading commissions. Mm -hmm. and, and we have collected data on fees. And so we're going to have that in the next draft of the paper as well. Okay, so we have actually another question where I think it's another suggestion I think is very good. So one thing that uh, I always have, uh, you know, whenever we study and, you know, we always in the same boat, whenever we study these individual behaviors or specific platform, the results are always contingent on how the platform is structured. So Carlos Carpi is asking, 
well, maybe if you have any information on how the app design changed during the period. So if you had that, maybe they did some sort of live A-B testing or maybe they changed the app, you can dig a little bit deeper into how much the design of the app can affect this um, you know, lottery kind of uh, type of investing and so on and so forth. Um, th that's a very good question. For one of the banks, we are trying to get information on their, how they've changed the design over time. Uh, to be totally like upfront, we don't have control on their design. So, but for one of the bank, we are we are uh, we are we are trying to get information on how things have changed over time. I see. see. Okay. And uh, sorry, I just one last comment, and I'll let you go. Yeah. So yeah no. One thing that I think is really interesting. So one thing that uh, I've always personally been very interested in is exactly this relationship between how long it takes for individuals from searching stocks onto the app to actually purchasing. I mean, we know in the kind of, and when it comes to desktop trading, we have some sort of evidence, but we don't have anything in terms of trading apps. So if you could get some sort of uh, uh, web click data from the apps, then you can connect them as if maybe what really is happening is that the time passage between uh, the, having the in stock in the information set and pulling the trigger, it gets shortened when people are trading on the app. Then maybe a kind of a, a kind of interesting result. Yeah, that's definitely something to look for. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alessandro. Let's move on to the next uh, speaker, who is uh, um, Stefano Giglio. He's going to present the inside the mind of a stock market crash. Stefano, you can feel free to share the screen and take it away. Okay, perfect. You see my screen? Perfect. Yeah. All right. So first of all, thank you very much, Albert. It's a pleasure to... Oh, this is going on on its own. Thank you. It's very. It's a pleasure to present this paper. Um, okay. So let me uh, start by saying this paper with uh, my co-authors, Matteo Maggiori, Johannes Strobel, and Steve Woodkus at Vanguard. And what we do in this paper is we study... Uh, the, in, mm, the beliefs and the trading behavior of, uh, of a large set of investors during the stock market crash of the, you know, during the recent COVID uh, stock market crash. So let me get started. So just to give a bit of a motivation, um, we think that, you know, understanding what happens in particularly bad states of the world is important, both for, for our theories, but also to inform policy. And basically this paper studies the, you know, as I said, beliefs and trading behavior during a particular uh, stock market crash for which we have kind of very uh, da data that allows to kind of say something uh, insightful about both the, you know, what's going on in people's minds, but also how they react to it. And so we're going to focus entirely in this paper on the COVID crash. Now, I, I want to give a bit of a background before I show you the results on this paper. So this paper builds on a collaboration that we have with Vanguard that has been going on for uh, now a few years in which every two months uh, we send out a survey uh, to a randomly selected large group of retail and retirement clients uh, of Vanguard. Okay, so we started the, running the survey in 2017. And this survey, as I said, you know, goes out to a large number of people via email every, uh, every uh, two months. Now, the response rates are, uh, you know, about 4% per, per, uh, every time we send an email. So, you know, it turns out that we have about 2,000 responses for each wave, okay? So imagine this is basically is a panel where we have every, uh, every two months about 2,000 responses. And um, any interesting aspect of, of the survey is that we actually uh, keep asking the same people over and over. And so we have uh, uh, often people respond, you know, for many waves at a time. So we really have a full panel dimension. We have not just a repeat of cross-section. We, we can see how people's beliefs evolve over time which is something we exploit uh, for this paper, okay? And the other key of this survey is that we, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you the exact, you know, an example of what we ask later, but, you know, we're gonna ask them basically broadly speaking about their beliefs about future returns and future GDP growth. And at the same time, we also observe uh, how they trade. We, we, are, we observe the entirety of their uh, Vanguard portfolios and trades, okay? Because basically the survey goes through Vanguard and you know, we basically get an anonymized ID that allows us to link the, the answers to a survey to a trading activity. Okay, so we're gonna be able to jointly analyze what they believe and how they trade. So here's what we ask in the survey. We focus on two, two, two uh, groups of questions. There's a question about stock returns and a question about GDP growth. So what do we ask? We ask, uh, we ask quantitative answers. So you know, we ask the, the, the participants who actually report the number, we ask, the expected one-year return on a diversified index, expected 10-year return, and then we ask a five-point distribution for the one-year return. So we say, you know, what's the probability 
that you know the stock market within the next year uh, you know the return will be lower than let's say minus 30 percent between minus 30 and 30 and 20 percent and so on and then we ask the same about gdp growth so we ask the short-term expectation the three years expectations the long-term expectation over 10 year and then a five-point distribution for a three-year growth so you see we ask very few questions because the point of this survey was to try to have a short survey the captures what beliefs that we think are important for you know our economic theories uh, but also a survey that you know was short enough that people were not discouraged in uh, answering again over time okay and in fact indeed the average time people uh, uh, take to reply to the survey is about eight minutes and indeed we see as i said before we see many time uh, people responding uh, again to the survey now one of the uh, so because of various constraints we had to decide over, on a, of a particular frequency we decided to uh, to to run the survey once every two months but at the time that we started you know about, about five years ago we uh, were designing the survey, we decided that it would be kind of interesting to have the ability to run a flash survey, like a very quick survey that we could basically run on command at any point in time and unscheduled time, right? And so um, we, uh, we ended up activating this feature when we saw this large crash uh, between February and March. And so basically what I'm gonna talk about today is gonna be uh, really focusing on what happened during the crash using basically three waves that are about one month apart each two of the regular waves and then this kind of flash wave that we activate in the mid. i should also say we have been uh, also studying this data for another paper uh called five acts about beliefs and portfolios where rather than focusing on this particular episode we study you know the kind of the longer run results over the last uh over the last three four years okay and so in this paper is really zooming in onto this episode just to this just to give a sense of what we ask this is, so you see this, the, the, the survey, they, when people click on the email, this is the survey they get, they see. Uh, the survey is, is, uh, is done through Radius, which is a company that administers surveys. And these are two examples of the questions, okay? This is the question about expected returns. We ask, uh, what do you expect the return of the US stock market to be over the next 12 months? And they, they, they have to just type down a number or they, have, they might have to type down uh, the, a distribution. As I said before, it was a five point distribution. So we give them five scenario of what the stock market could do over the next year. And the participants, the respondents have to kind of fill in these boxes and they're constrained to sum up to 100%. And as they type, they see the histogram on the right hand side. Okay, so I think it's pretty standard uh, survey. Uh, it's kind of targeted to, uh, to answer questions that we think are uh, important. So in terms of the timing, okay, so it just happened that, you know, our regular wave, you see here, these, these gray bars are the waves. Uh, they, they are the timing of the of the wave um, as we when we launched the, each wave, and here you see this this solid line is the S and P five hundred level, and you see there are two regular waves in blue. They were scheduled, you know, one around mid February, one around mid April. We didn't touch those. It just happened that you know the first wave, uh, the February wave, just basically hit exactly or almost exactly the the, the peak of the market, and then you know the, when we we saw the, this big uh, this big crash over here we decided to, to run this flash wave. And so you see, we didn't time it perfectly, unfortunately, the exact bottom of the market, but we, we were pretty close. Okay, so, you know, we actually have, and then you see the third wave is kind of midway through the recovery. Okay, so in this paper, we study beliefs and portfolio over this time between basically January and April. Okay, so let me start by showing you some, uh, some of the results. Okay, so first of all, I will, um, I will show you the, um, how the expected one-year return evolves during this time. So you can see this graph actually is plotting all the data we have. So it starts in 2017, okay? That's when we started running the survey. This is the cross-sectional average of the responses, okay? So on average, people responding, they expect about a 5% return uh, over the next year. You can see that it was stable for a while. You know, it went up a bit to 6%. In, in the end of 2018, went down to about 3%. You know, it fluctuated over time, okay? And then you can see that at the very end, you see this dot here is just our pre-crash survey. It was really at the peak. People were very optimistic in February. They expected a 6% return. Then the crash occurs and there's a, there was a massive drop of expectation down to 1% and then a very, very small recovery. It's, it's actually kind of interesting that uh, you'll see this later also, the recovery in the stock market was much faster than the recovery in basically any of the expectations that we have, okay? So even though this is February, March, April, even though by April, the stock market basically already kind of, or not fully, but you know, already significantly recover, 
our expectation took much longer to, to, to recover. Okay, but you see, there was basically this, this is the average belief. On average, our respondents became much, much more pessimist. Okay, that's kind of a first order fact. And the other very interesting thing that happened is that if you look, he said that the 10 year expectations, they in fact didn't change. I mean, if you look at the scale here, you see that the movements are in general pretty small. If anything, they went up during the crash, but you know, by 0.2%. So basically they didn't move. So somehow in our investors in our sample, they, be, they, they, they perceive kind of a you know, much more, um, much lower returns going forward for the short term, but they didn't think that any of what that was happening really affected the long game. So this was all perceived to be kind of a transitory, a transitory crash. Okay. Um, and now, if you remember, we asked three things, really. We asked about the short-term expected returns. We asked about the long-term expected returns. And then we asked the distribution of the short-term returns. So we don't ask about the long-term returns, so I don't have results on distribution of long-term returns. But for the short term, for the one year return, we actually ask what's the probability of different events. And so the reason why we designed that, uh, the question in that way is because we are interested in testing rare disaster theories, okay? So in fact, we have been that kind of map very nicely to a standard rare disaster uh, literature. And so uh, here's a probability of stock returns below minus 30% over the next year, which is something that on average happens about 5% of the years. And you can see, that uh, this probability of disaster, uh, perceived probability of disaster really spiked during the crash. And again, it didn't really revert in April. Okay, so somehow people became much more uh, afraid of some very large negative shock. Okay, went down to about 5% average to about 8%. Okay. So, um, okay, so this was, what all, everything I showed you so far was about how the average beliefs moved, okay? So now I'm going to start kind of, this, kind of this, this, decomposing this a bit more into how different people uh, uh, beliefs uh, evolved. Okay, so this graph is just showing you three histograms of the beliefs about one year expected return across people at three points in time. Okay, so these are three histograms. You think of it just a description of how the cross section of beliefs look like. Okay, so this dotted line that looks different from the others, dashed line is different from the others. That's the Eastern of beliefs in, uh, in February before the crash, okay? You can see that most people believe between somewhere between zero and 15% uh, expected returns with kind of pretty thin tails. What happened in March and confirmed in April is that you see this entire distribution moved to the left, first of all, as I said before, you know, people became on average more pessimistic, but also you see the very strong fattening of this left tail. Okay, so it's the left tail really became bigger and that's what drove down the mean. So a supply chain number of people uh, really uh, behave, became more pessimistic. Okay, so they, they started believing that, you know, minus 20, minus 30% returns were actually kind of possibly um, uh, in the future. And importantly, remember, this is something that happened after the crash already occurred, right? Because by, by already by mid-March, the biggest, you know, the biggest crash, the biggest component of the crash has already occurred. So people saw this very large disaster. They basically behave in some sort of extrapolative way. And now they, they have a much, uh, much more pessimistic returns going forward. Okay. So there's a substantial mass of people that now believes that, you know, that the, 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 the expects returns kind of strongly below zero. Okay. Uh, just for comparison, everything I showed you so far was for uh, stock returns. We see some very similar patterns for GDP growth. So the short-term GDP growth, you see it kind of collapsed, even though the magnitudes are actually not that large. So it seems to be the investors perceive that much, you know, that the crash was more of like a financial phenomenon than a real phenomenon. And again, for, for GDP growth, the... Uh, and I don't have it here, but, you know, for GDP growth, again, the long-term expectation didn't really move much. And also the probability of disaster for GDP went up again. Okay, so basically to summarize, what we see is that people really became more pessimistic, but most about the short term and most about returns. Okay, so now I want to really try to exploit the panel structure I have in, in, in my data to explore not just how the average beliefs change, but how, how different types of people uh, change their beliefs. In particular, I'm going to be distinguishing between the optimism and the pessimism. So the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna look at the February wave. I'm gonna classify people in February as optimists or pessimists, depending on their beliefs about the one year expected return then. And then I'm gonna track each group over time by exploiting the fact that the same people responded over and over again to, this, to the survey. 
Now, the, this is uh, one of our two main results of this paper. So it's really plotting the evolution of beliefs of different people over time. So let me describe this table in detail. These four rows are the four buckets of, of, of in which we place people based on family. Okay, so the most pessimistic people are those that believe uh, that the expected return was negative in February already, and the most optimistic are those that believe the expected return was about ten percent in February. Okay, and then what I have here uh, on the right, every column are uh, basically beams of uh, changes in belief over time. Okay, so basically you can see there. Are these less than 20 minus 20 percent are people that uh that for example this this, this row here this, this cell here is people that were pessimistic in february okay and they revised downwards their beliefs by more than 20 percent okay so these are revised downwards you know all the way to zero percent and these last two columns are the mass of people that actually revise upwards their beliefs so for each row we're decomposing what mass of investors had a particular change in beliefs okay and let me just summarize what we find. Okay, so look, let's start from the last row. These are people that were already uh, optimistic. They were optimistic in February. What happened to them? Well, you see that the biggest mass of people actually is in these first four columns, which means that they become more pessimistic. Okay, only thirteen percent actually become more optimistic. Now, when you just decompose how many for each row, how many actually become more optimistic, how many become more pessimistic? What you see is that for all the groups a small fraction became more optimistic, the mass of people really became more pessimistic. So what I showed you before, which is this kind of that on average people became more pessimistic, is actually shared by every group. It's shared by almost every group, in fact, except those who were already very pessimistic. You see, if you look at the first row, among those who were already very pessimistic, in fact, 63% actually became more optimistic. Okay, so this is not just me reverse, it is really a very big change in Everyone is kind of more pessimistic, but those who are pessimistic actually become uh, more optimistic. Okay. And uh, so these are be, is our uh, results on beliefs. How do you believe pessimistic, but they're actually quite significant heterogeneity across different types of people? Now, the most interesting results are instead when we link beliefs and trading. We can now ask how did this, each of these groups actually change to trade during this period? Okay. And the first kind of very striking fact is that. Actually, despite the fact that so many people change their beliefs so massively, really 70% of people didn't trade at all. So over these entire two months, despite this big change in beliefs, people don't trade, okay? Now, when they trade, they do trade in a way that actually kind of makes sense. So we actually see that we, what, what they do is that as they become more pessimistic, they sell equities and they sell bonds and they move to short-term bonds or cash. Uh, but it's quite striking that you know, so many of them don't actually don't actually trade. So if you actually look at the aggregated trade out of equity during this period was just 1% of the portfolio share. So people did kind of sell equities, but in a very small number. Now it's interesting to look, to kind of zoom in a little bit and look at um, how uh, people are trading conditional trading. So let's focus on, those, on that 30% that actually trades. What would they do? So here's a graph that summarizes our results. So again, just to go slowly over it, this, uh, the solid line is the S&P 500, just to give us some reference point. And uh, that's on the right-hand side um, axis. And then what we have here in these three dashed lines are the fraction of the portfolio of different groups of investors that they hold in equities. So let's look at what happens in February to give us this reference point. In February, the optimist, which is this group over here, they held about 68% of the portfolios in equities. The middle bin, the, you know, the, new, the one with neutral beliefs, they uh, held about 60% in in, of the portfolio in equities. And then the pessimists, they held about 58% in equities. Okay? So you can see that the, you know, the optimists, those that, were, you know, that are optimists, they indeed hold more equity than those that are pessimists. This is something we documented in the previous paper. And now what we want to do in here is we want to check you know, how the people change their portfolios uh, over this time period. And you can see that indeed everybody's selling equities. It's interesting that the pessimists actually basically didn't really change their allocation. And that should not be surprising because remember, you know, the, the pessimists on average didn't really change their beliefs because some, some of them became more pessimistic, but more than half of them actually became more optimistic. Okay. And so indeed, it's not surprising to see the pessimists actually on average didn't change their portfolio. 
And instead, the opt-ins are the ones that actually revise downwards their beliefs the most, and indeed they also revise downwards their 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 uh, their equity shares the most. Okay, so they go from a equity share about sixty-eight percent to at the bottom about sixty-four percent. Okay, so these are not very large number. In the other paper, we had documented in normal times people don't seem to react much, so they're acting in the right direction, but quantitatively they don't react very strongly to their change in beliefs. So they change their portfolios. You know, they become more more optimistic. They buy. When you become more pessimistic, they sell, but the quantity, the magnitudes of these changes are small, at least small to compare to our standard models. Here we show that, you know, even in such a big crash where people actually would, you'd really expect them to trade a lot. They actually, first of all, they don't trade much because 70% doesn't trade. And those that trade, they trade in the right direction by, by, uh, by leap. Okay. And, you know, when you combine, you know, these, remember, these are the trades of the 30% that trades. So when I look at the unconditional changes in trade, they include both those that trade and those that don't trade. Of course, everything becomes more muted. And now you see much, much less. So you see that even those that are optimistic, they change their portfolio by, you know, at most, let's say, 1%. So really, there is very little, in a sense, reaction in terms of portfolios to the beliefs. Okay. Uh, in the last two minutes, let me just say that, you know, it's also interesting to see how the different beliefs kind of change this together. So, you know, beliefs about portfolios, belief about GDP, belief about the long and the short run. And so these are just a correlation table uh, in our panel about the responses to different questions. Okay, so for example, what we see is that uh, stock returns and GDP expectations uh, are actually correlated. Okay, so the first column here are expected returns and the, this uh, this uh, cell here tells us the correlation between expectation of short-term returns and expectation of short-term GDP growth. They're positively correlated, right? So those, those investors become more pessimistic about one. They also become more pessimistic about the other. Um, there is much, there is pretty low correlation between the short-term expectations and the long-term expectation, which is this 0.06 here. Um, and then there is a pretty high correlation in the disaster probabilities. Okay, so this 0.23 is the correlation between the disaster, the perceived disaster probability in GDP, which is a growth of, let's say, minus, less than minus 3% per year for three years, and the GDP, and the disaster in, in stock returns. It's, again, it's pretty high. So all these numbers kind of make sense. So it's not like people are, 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 are responding in a kind of random way. It seems to be pretty coherent. Uh, the one thing that is quite puzzling that we explore more in the other paper is the fact that when people, you see there's a very strong negative correlation between probability of disaster and expected returns. So when people become more pessimistic, they think there is a higher probability of a disaster, they actually expect lower returns, which is kind of puzzling from the point of view of the standard rate disaster models, because in the standard models, we you have, you know, when people be, have a high probability of a disaster, where they perceive a high probability of disaster, they should also realize there is premium particularly high in that period, okay? So there's a, you know, we have a discussion of this in the paper. Basically, you know, you, you need a model with some sort of either agree to disagreement or differential information, heterogeneity to explain this result. Okay, but basically the point here is that when you look at these, uh, at this kind of small window where there was a lot of action in terms of beliefs, you actually do see uh, the same patterns that you see over a long horizon, which include basically mostly normal times, which we've looked at in the other paper. Okay, and this is really like what I want to talk about. So I want to kind of take a step back now and try to think about what do we make of these results? Okay, how do we interpret these in terms of, of theories? And there are really two groups of results, right? There's a dynamics of beliefs and dynamics of trade. So what do we learn from our results on dynamics of beliefs? Um, so first of all, we, we, one of the, probably the, one of the most striking facts is that people became really much more pessimistic right after they saw a huge crash. So that really sounds to suggest that people are extrapolative, which is something that's been explored uh, in the recent literature. Uh, there is this interesting result that is a disaster model just discussed. And then really probably the most, the most interesting result of all is that there is a lot of heterogeneity. Not everybody be, like, behaves in the same way. Not everybody updates their beliefs in the same way. Some people, groups of people we can identify exactly became more pessimistic and other groups became more optimistic. And, uh, and really that tells us that, you know, they should push us to kind of go beyond the standard representative agent uh, models. And in terms of trading, the bottom line is people just don't seem to react much to their beliefs, even when the beliefs change by a lot. And I think that it tells us this transmission mechanism between beliefs and portfolio is, uh, is weak. And it's something that is 
something we don't typically consider our model and it's another way to understand better and, and incorporate when we write down uh, theories. Okay, and I'm done. And that's, that's the bit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefano, for the awesome presentation. Uh, first of all, I have um, a question for you. And maybe, I don't know if you have the results already or not, but how long did it take? So did, did those uh, densities of uh, expectation just move back to the pre-crisis period over time? Or have you looked at what happens uh, over the past couple of months? Yes, they, they have, they, they certainly move back. I mean, so that paper stops in, in April. We have updated the, the results over the next few months and they do move back eventually, but it just takes a much longer time. I, I don't remember exact now because we're, we're working, we are soon going to work on a new paper on this. So, you know, we're still in the process of looking at the data, but uh, it's it certainly not until the summer, basically. I see. The things move back. Yeah. Then, but we don't know why. Yeah. I see that's, uh, so we have a question from, uh, uh, I think Alessandro has a raised hand, but also Antonio wrote a question in the chat. So let me ask you first a question from Antonio. He says, do you have information of how often individuals in your sample acquire information about the stock market? Uh, maybe you have the more attentive individual change their beliefs more often and are more extrapolative. Great question. So, okay. So we didn't do it in this paper, but in the previous paper, which we have a longer time period, you actually thought exactly about that. And so we actually, I think we have a pretty nice measure of attention because we can see from, so from Gan Vanguard, we actually get data on exactly when each person logs into the website. And, you know, this is not just to trade, you can just, you know, just to check the market. And so or check how your portfolio is doing. So indeed we do see, and that we did in the other paper, that people that do, um, uh, people that do, they are more attentive according to this criterion, uh, they indeed do, they align their portfolios to their beliefs more, more strong. That's, that's the case. Basically with about twice the magnitude that the other people. Okay. Yeah. Then we have a question from uh, uh, Alessandro. You can uh, unmute and talk. Yep. Uh, very nice paper, Stefano. Uh, I, I was wondering, how do you reconcile your evidence with the Guiso Sapienza Zingales time varying risk aversion paper? It's the 2018 JFE paper. Basically, they look at the previous financial crisis, survey people between uh, 2007 and 2009, and they find no change in expectation. They look at the distribution of expectation of the 12 month stock market returns, and they find no change. And the entire distribution, it's kind of, it's, it's amazing. Um, and then the, the follow-up question is, the major mechanism they point out in the paper is fear and emotion uh, that have an effect on investing. And this maybe can explain a bit this, this, this notion how, you know, uh, the, it's difficult to reconcile with the, the rare disaster models, but if you are afraid and if the negative outcomes now become more salient, they might induce you lower expectation going forward. Okay. So that, that's a great question. I don't know exactly the sample they use for, for their survey. I can tell you that we have compared our survey with many other surveys in the, in the other paper. Okay, so we looked at the, uh, at the rent survey. Uh, we look at the um, Association of American Investors. We look at the Schiller survey. All of these surveys, they move around basically as much as ours. So I, I, don't, I don't know exactly with what's going on with, with Luigi's uh, survey. Uh, and, uh, but, but, you know, the, our change in average beef actually lines up quite nicely with, with the other, the other surveys we looked at. So that's one point. The other point on risk aversion is very interesting. So we actually don't look at, we, you know, we, we don't try to, to kind of extract measures of sentiment or fear or risk aversion. And part of it is really a choice of trying to keep the survey short. So we, I, I can't speak directly to that. It's possible that some of that will be reflecting this probability of disasters. If people kind of respond to these probabilities reporting somewhat, you know, it could spot you know, your fear might actually be reflected in a higher perceived probability of the disaster. So it might be that, that there's a connection between the two. It might be that this kind of, this mediates the, 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 the relation that we see between the expected returns and disaster probability. It, it's something that, you know, I guess without any direct measure of, of risk aversion, it's kind of hard to, to test direct, but it's certainly possible. Thank you. Perfect. Then we have, uh, we don't have too, too much time, but we have uh, two questions. So one comes from Matteo Pierovano, who's asking, are initially more pessimistic people more likely to stop responding to your surveys? Did you check that? So we have not checked. It's actually, yes, it, it's a good point. So is there anything that predicts what, you know, the real response rates? Uh, it's something that we had at some point thought about checking, but we never actually ended up doing because it was not directly useful for what we were doing, but it's a, it's a good question. Yes, we, we check. 
Then the last question comes from uh, Christina Constantine, who's uh, saying, uh, you've been uh, talking about uh, kind of how in individuals uh, change their portfolio location across broad asset classes, but have you, are you kind of, uh, are you thinking about working with uh, individual stocks and individual ETFs that people are taking? Yes. So indeed we see, so we see everything. We see, you know, we see, you know, the cues of every stock or, or mutual fund they buy or sell. So, you know, it's certainly, it, it, it's part of the things we're working on now. Uh, we, so, you know, it just takes a long time to work with, disaggregated data so but yes it's part of the of the plan perfect thank you so much stefano for the thank presentation you, and uh, let's move on to the last paper who's going to be presented by enriqueta ravina and the title is uh, retail investors contrarian behavior are on news and the momentum effect so uh Alberto, thank you very much for inviting our paper. And also congratulations on, on a very successful online seminar that you know, a lot of people attend. Um, so this paper is, about, is joint with Patrick Luo, who was a PhD student at Harvard Business School and now is at Farallon Capital, with Marco Sammon, who is a PhD at Northwestern and will go to Harvard Business School. And with Luis Vicera, who is at Harvard Business School. And uh, uh, this, the view uh, expressed here are our own only and do not reflect those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. So what do we do in this paper? In this paper, we study the, um, the role of the retail investor in the gradual diffusion of information in financial markets and in the momentum, in the momentum effect. More specifically, we are gonna analyze the, behavior, the behavior of these retail investors around the earnings announcements. And then in addition of checking what are the implications for them in terms of returns, uh, horizon and general behavior, we also look at the implication for, um, for asset pricing and, uh, and connect their behavior to, to momentum. So retail investors are a prime candidate to be connected with uh, the momentum effect because they hold quite a lot of equities uh, in the US, although this fraction has been going down over time. And uh, most of the theories that we have about you know, slow adjustments of prices um, have some like behavioral aspect in them. And they definitely require someone to be on the losing side of, uh, of the transaction. And so it seems from what we find that these retail investors, the ones at least that are contrarian, which is the majority of them, end up being on the losing side of the momentum effect. So they sell very early without realizing that you know past winners tend to continue to be winners for months and months after the the formation period. Okay, so what are our main findings since we are the last uh, paper of the, the program? I'm gonna summarize them here and in case we are losing people. Uh, so we find that retail investor uh, trading around the earnings announcement and also product, new products announcement is a consistently contrarian. When there is a positive news, they tend to sell. And when there is negative news, they tend to buy. And this effect is much stronger for the loser. So buying losers that actually selling winners as I'm gonna show you. As a result of this, uh, the retail investor net flow into momentum stock is negative for positive momentum stock, the winners, and positive for the, for the losers. Um, <coughs> One other thing that we are checking is to say if the retail investors have really a role in generating the momentum effect, then we should see that the momentum effect is more prominent only among those stocks that have a high retail trading intensity. While stocks that end up in the loser and the winner's portfolio, but don't have a lot of retail traders should not display the the spread between loser and winners in terms of returns. And that's what we find and we are gonna, we are gonna show you. We also uh, consistent with previous literature find that most of the effect is concentrated in the short leg among the losers. Uh, we also find that these retail investors tend to own as a group the entire set of stocks out there, but each one of them tends to have not to have a lot of stocks actually. And they tend to trade very specifically on stock related information. So um, if there are company news, they only trade the stock, they don't trade ETFs. And if there are macro news, they only trade ETFs and they don't really 
think or like trade on the implication that the macro news might have for some of the stocks that they are holding. Okay, this is a very, very uh, short uh, summary of the literature. So you're gonna probably be in the dots, the very three dots that I put at the end. Um, the, our paper is related to, closely related at least, to three, uh, to, Two sets of papers. One is about momentum effect and earning surprises, the role of earning surprises in momentum, and these are the most prominent papers that we found, um, but we're, I'm sure we are missing many of them. Then there is another big literature about retail investor trading, and here specifically I'm highlighting papers that also look at whether investors are contrarians, whether what is their behavior around the earnings announcements, and whether they have a disposition effect, and um, there is a paper by Antonio Gargano and Alberto Rossi that focuses on the role of attention. And they are able to, uh, to use uh, clicks, web clicks, and see where people go on the platform to, uh, to estimate, you know whether people that pay more attention in the way they pay attention affects their behavior. And we will be able to do, to do the same as well. Okay, so um, let me give you a little bit of a summary of the investor's data. This is a proprietary data set, comes from one of the largest US discount brokers. Um, if you are familiar with the Odin data set, it's, a little, it's similar, it's also a brokerage uh, data set, is more recent from 2010 to 2014, and it's way larger. But we, we, if we compare the type of traders that uh, we see in our data set and we, uh, to those on, in Odin, they tend to have similar characteristics. Uh, in our case, we have 2.3 million accounts. They are about worth 215 billion if you take the average across the time. Uh, for 11,000 of them, we can also see the web click activity. So we see which page they see, when, do they, when they log in, whether they log in to trade or to look at research or to look at other stuff. Of course, we don't know what they do outside of the platform, but their platform is quite engaging and it has a lot of content. Um, in terms of age, gender, trading frequencies, they are very similar to uh, the Odin data sets. I'm gonna show you in the next slides. 65% of them is men, 25% of is women, and the remaining is not classified. The age distribution is bell-shaped. It peaks at 43 years old. And if you compare, for example, uh, this uh, to the average age in the survey of consumer finances, that would be around 53, 55. So these people are significantly younger. Um, this is a snapshot at the end of the sample about uh, how many accounts we have that are taxable individual accounts, retirement accounts, IRAs mainly. Uh, and then we have a little bit of, of accounts that are, come from organizations and foreign individuals or organizations. They are here in the summary statistic. We drop them in the rest of the analysis. Uh, these, two, these two groups here tend to behave a little less contrarian, they tend to have uh, portfolio tilts that are uh, associated with better returns, they seem to behave um, in, a, in a better way, at least from the point of view of their exposed returns. And like I said, this is the number of uh, stocks that they have, they have option bonds and so on. Okay, so, oh, I apologize, we have a, like, a little bit of a mess here, but overall, most, uh, a lot of the accounts uh, are active in the sense that they log in, but they don't trade much. But there is a tail of people that trades quite a lot. And so the distribution of the number of times you traded, uh, the number of months you traded, the turnover and so on, is very, is very, very skewed. Okay, so let me, uh, let me tell you what, are our, uh, what is our, our analysis and how we connect the behavior and the trading of these individuals around earnings announcements to the momentum effect. So we create uh, two by five portfolios, double sorted first on size and then in momentum. And then we calculate for each of these uh, five momentum portfolios, the net, net inflow coming from individuals normalized by the volume for that specific stock that we see on CRISP. Uh, we have results both like just looking at this, oops, just looking at this quantity, some, we also sometimes subtract the cross-sectional mean. The patterns are the same. Uh, we do subtract the cross-sectional mean in line with the rest of the literature, Kanyel and Odin, for example, just because uh, this is a period in which um, 
in the retail investor are closing their position and closing their accounts. So there is a trend that is uh, in some cases going down that is that might mask the differences across people that are always there. But both results are available for people to, to evaluate. And then we calculate also the absolute flow, buys plus sell. Uh, once we do that, this is what we get if we take the average across time. So if you look at the losers, you see that uh, uh, retail investors tend to be net buyers of the losers. And this is how the, their net flows move across uh, portfolios. So they tend to sell the winner and buy the losers. Uh, most, if you just look at the total intensity of the retail activity, it's concentrated in the two extreme portfolios, winners and losers, and it's bigger for the losers. Um, then here we just double checking that, uh, you know, previous, uh, we know from previous papers that uh, one of the determinants of a stock entering a, a momentum portfolio is the string of uh, earnings uh, surprises that the stock experiences over time. And so the winners tend to have a positive string of earnings surprises and the losers tend to have a negative one. This is true also for the stocks these people are invested in. And here is their cumulative retail flow around earnings. So if you see at time zero, there is an earnings surprise. And these are the best earnings surprise, and these are the worst earnings surprise. So no matter what earnings surprise there is, there is a, in the few, like in the day really, around the announcement, people maybe for attention effects or other reasons, they tend to buy, they tend to buy everything. But then if you look at the cumulative flows, you see that the best um, stocks that uh, have the best earnings surprise tend to actually have outflows as you go. And uh, on the contrary, the losers, which is the blue line on top, tend to have massive inflows at the moment of the earnings, in the moment of the negative earnings surprise, and then these inflows actually persist. So people don't traverse their position. So people seem to buy loser basically, maybe hoping that they uh, resurrect or some other reason. And this is just another way to slice uh, to slice the results. If you take the momentum effects and separate them, uh, the momentum portfolios and separate them into those that had very small surprises in absolute terms and very large surprises in absolute terms, positive and negative, you see that most of the action in terms of momentum comes from the cases in which we have uh, big surprises and the loser uh, experiencing flows and the winners outflows. Okay, so the first robustness check that we do is to say, okay, if this is true, then if we take just a measure of retail intensity, retail trading intensity, then we should see a momentum effect, like the losers are like the have returns that are significantly smaller than the winners, only for those stocks which in each momentum portfolio that have a lot of retail tradings. So these are the losers, and these are the winners, and these are the losers with very little retail intensity, the bottom uh, quintile, and these are the losers with a lot of retail intensity, same for the winners. And you see that the, the first three um, quintiles of retail intensity don't really have the momentum effect. Actually, the losers are doing better than the winners in the first on average. But as retail intensity increases, you start to see in this difference. Okay. Another way of seeing this result is to say going forward, if I sit at zero and I look at the group that has a group of stock that has very little retail intensity and the group of stock that has a lot of retail intensity, group five, I see that the spread between winners and losers in terms of returns is really very strong for group five and it's much weaker for the other groups. Okay. Now you might wonder, or at least we did, it's like, okay, these results are definitely in line with uh, uh, investors taking the wrong side of the momentum trade, but does it really matter? Are they big enough as a group to affect actually the prices? And, uh, and so we did some research on that. First, we look at the fraction of um, crisp volume that we are capturing in our data set. So for each stock, we look at, uh, um, you know, we just calculate the volume at any point, any day in our data set and uh, divided by the, by the crisp volume for the stocks and take the weighted or equal average. The weighted average is weighting by market cap of the stock and the equal average 
is, uh, is not. And as you can see, well, our, um, our retail investors, like a lot of other retail investors in brokerage accounts, tend to focus on small stocks. So the equal, uh, the equal weighted average is higher, but they basically make up between one and 3% of the total retail flow. However, this is only one retail uh, brokerage. What if we can you know, blow up the behavior of these investors to the total amount that is under management for a retail brokerage? And when we do that, we see that the two per, uh, in our data set, there is more or less 2% of retail ownership. And we calculate this by looking stock by stock and doing one minus institutional ownership and here institutions are the one from Thomson Reuters. So these are institutions with at least 100 million. Uh, so it's possible that in this uh, calculation, there are a little bit of small institutions that end up in our, in our uh, calculations as well. But if you do that, they have about 2% of retail ownership. Uh, if you do equal weight or 4%, I should have highlighted this as well, if you do, um, sorry, 4% on an equal weight and 2% on value weight. And so this means that uh, if they are 2% of retail ownership and all the retail investors behave in the same way, then we need to multiply this to 50 by 50 if we want to get to 100% of retail ownership. So all the flows should be multiplied by 50 times. If we do that, they're still not the biggest uh, um, group in the markets, those are institutions, but they are a significant groups. And I think that the recent uh, GameStop saga tells us that sometimes retail investors can have an effect. Um, one other thing that we are looking at is timing. So if we look at the cumulative uh, retail flow into winners and losers, then is it true that this lines up with the time evolution of returns? And here you see that the returns from a momentum strategy that goes long the winners and short to the losers peaks between 10 and 15 months. And more or less, this is, we are, we are working on more precise uh, measures of this, but like just by eyeballing, you see that it, at least it, it seems to be consistent. And you also see that the biggest effect comes from the losers. Okay, alternative explanations. One alternative explanation is just, this is one uh, manifestation of the disposition effect. The tendency to hold on to winners and sell, uh, and sorry, hold on to losers and sell your winners. And this is an alternative explanation for the, uh, for the part, for the winner part, for the fact that we see people selling stocks when there is positive earnings surprise, not for the losers. But we're gonna look at it for the winner's part. Another possibility is these, these are stale orders. So you put a limit order for a certain price a long time ago, then you forget about it. And then it seems that you know, once the price hits your, your, limit, your limit order, you are trading, but you are not really trading, reacting to earnings surprises or the increase in price, you're just you know, not paying attention to your order. Another possibility is that these people follow analyst recommendation and they look at the band with that the analyst suggests, and we haven't done this part yet, but it's in the other uh, alternative explanation are portfolio rebalancing, uh, thinking, uh, or truly trading on inform in information, tax considerations, trading costs as well. So let's start with the disposition effect that is the most important. So first we replicate Odin 1998 in our data set and show that generally speaking in our data set there is a disposition effect and it's actually even slightly stronger than the one in the Odin data set although it's pretty, it's pretty similar, it is in the mold park. Then what we are doing is we focus on the uh, earnings announcements on the three days, uh, well, the day before and day zero to three to plus three around the earnings announcement. And for that, we see uh, for every stock that has an earnings announcement, we go in our data set and collect everybody that owns that stock so that could potentially trade on the stock. And then we check whether you're selling or not and whether, whether you're selling or not around the earning anna, earn, earnings announcement depends on your like uh, uh, implicit gain, like we calculate your cost basis. So we see across all your, uh, all your portfolio, 
which was the stock that had the highest uh, gain, the lowest, and so on. And this is the regressions that we look at. And we do fixed effect uh, by account, by stock, and it doesn't really matter. So, and we also double cluster. So let me focus on the case with no fixed effect. So we see that around earning announcement, even in a data set with, with, that has a strong disposition effect, actually when there is a gain, you're slightly less likely to sell. When there is a large positive earning surprise, you are selling. And, and then uh, when they, they don't seem to be super correlated, like the coefficients don't change much. And then there is an interaction that tells us, you know, uh, once there is an earning surprise, the higher the gain that you would realize by selling actually is negatively correlated with, with, you, with, with you selling. And uh, what we make out of it is going to like this finding is going to help us a little bit also understand why are people selling as contrarian and one possibility is that they have some position that is not super um is doesn't have a very high return or at least their own return is not very high and when they see the jump in price they take this opportunity to close their position and to realize at least some positive return Another uh, possibility is to say, what about stale orders? So here in our data set, most of the uh, orders are actually limit orders. They are not market orders. But this is partially due, I think, to the way the um, to the way the platform is set up. Like the default is a limit order, <laughs> and indeed, most people putting limit orders that are extremely close to the current price in the market at the time, so that their limit orders get filled in 106 seconds. So they are truly market orders. But <coughs> Excuse me. It's very dry in here. So one other thing that we do is to calculate a contrarian index. How many times you as an individual trade in a contrarian way out of your total trades? And um, in general, and around earnings announcements. And so for people that have at least two trades, this is how it looks like. For people that have at least 12 trades, this is how it looks like. So there are some extremist cases of people that have like, you know, never trade as a contrarian or always trade as a contrarian. And then there is some sort of like distribution. But for a lot of cases, and this is true whether you take an average across all the stocks, whether you do it by stock first and take an average after, is is quite robust. Who are the contrarian people? The contrarian people are people that tend to be younger. They are day traders. Um, they tend to be um, male, actually, uh, but this, uh, this effect is not, is not very strong. Okay, let me go. We are running out of time. So this is, our, this is a list in our view, but uh, it would be great to you know, see you, have your view as well of the reason why people are contrarian. There is evidence that people believe in mean reversion of returns. So what come, goes up must go down. Uh, maybe they're cutting their losses. Maybe they have a target return in mind, like I'm going to exit this position when I make 10%, 15, 5. And then whenever that happens, they don't think about the future. Or maybe they think they have uh, real or perceived information, which is one of the hypotheses actually in Kanyel and Cotter. So we are calculating returns now for uh, everybody and holding periods. And so we will be able to have a better idea of this. The next step is to look at the role of attention. Are contrarian people, people that pay a lot of attention? Do they pay, uh, when do they pay the most attention? How do they differ from others? We also calculated the portfolio tilts of these people and a measure of uh, um, their sophistication based on Daniel and Cotter's paper. Um, another thing that we want to look at is superior analysis and also create a contrarian index for the stocks. What are the stocks that get the most contrarian trading? And based on preliminary analysis, are stock that are loser, small, low analyst coverage type of stocks. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to unshare and I will look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Enriqueta, for the awesome presentation. So one, uh, I think, uh, question, so I think it was more of a comment um, that Neil Stockton has, and maybe you can relate to how the, the, the platform you're using. It says that, um, Neil says on his uh, discount brokerage account, you have to choose the time limit where you want the limit order to remain. Is this the same in the platform you're working with, or is it different? Yeah, I have an account just for, 
to check exactly this type of things, and it is indeed the case. We don't observe it in our data set, so we cannot tell whether you pick end of day or something else. We can only see how quick your order gets executed, so the limit gets it, but yeah, people can pick. So in, maybe, you know, people put limit orders that have a very short, that are very short lived. And from our point of view of wanting to making sure that there are no stale, um, you know, try, uh, like orders, a, a limit order with a very short horizon is similar to a market order. Okay. And then one question that this is kind of more related to the, the how do these people actually think about this earnings announcement? Do Have you checked trying to use the logging activity and the actual web clicks? whether individuals are logged in and they actually wait for the announcement release or is it some, you actually see the login after the earnings is uh, um, realized and maybe they see it from the news. Like, is it something that they are kind of getting ready for or is it something instead that they see on the news and then they go back and try to trade? So we have the information, we haven't done it yet, but it's a very good suggestion to try to understand First, when did they buy? When is their holding period? Did they bought just recently, you know, maybe two or three days ago and wait for the, for the announcement? Did they buy a long time ago? And maybe if the surprise is big, it goes in the news or it goes to their web page and they realize and they're like, you know, sort of, yeah. they trade while they wouldn't otherwise. So uh, unfortunately, I don't, have, uh, I don't have answer yet, but is this something very interesting and something that we can, we can definitely do? We know that people that are more contrarian pay more attention. There is a correlation, but this is like just and you know how many times they go on the web page. We didn't really look at the timing, the timing yet. Yeah, and then also one thing that I think is a kind of interesting. I think in the, in the, in the context of the GameStop, you and you know I know that I have kind of some sort of insider information regarding the platform you're using, but uh, I know that uh, you also have potentially options that you can explore. So it may be one that you may want to do is exactly trying to see how much of a leverage individuals are willing to take exactly around these earnings announcements when they want to have this directional trade. That's a very good idea. At the moment, we are using options. The ability to trade option is a, one of the proxy of sophistication. It's not a very high bar to be approved, but you know, people are approved, but it would be also great to see if they take any other position that is not just stocks to give us a sense of how strongly they believe in the trades that you know, they're going to make, or maybe they just take option and futures positions and they don't actually trade the stock. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think we are out of time, but let me take a moment to thank very much uh, Stefano Enriqueta and Alessandro for three fantastic presentations. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. I think another question came in, but um, maybe I think it's, uh, we, we can, I can send it to you, Enriqueta, via email. Um, uh, note that uh, we will not have uh, events um, for the month of March because we have a number of uh, events related to Women's History Month at the center. So please uh, follow uh, us on uh, Twitter at uh, GU Fin Policy as well as check our website uh, for the initiatives we're going to have for the month. Enjoy your weekend. See you later. Thank you. Bye.